All right, so um, let's get started. It's um, it's 10 o'clock here Pacific time. This is Jeff at the Big Hairy Dog. This is a webinar for Retail Pro version 9 on auto utilities and also includes a little multi-store because auto utilities can do both single or multi-store. That's our rough agenda right there. Um, certainly, again, if you guys have questions, throw them in the chat or, or jump in on the phone or... Uh, ask me to unmute you, and I can unmute you. Um, any, any of the all, in, in, any of those options are good. Um, all right, so, you know, the concept, of course, is to set up a, a level. So let's pop into inventory. Let's start here. In inventory, typically we have an auto min max tab. And we have a min and we have a max that we can set for a given item in a given store, right? So if I click the uh, inventory quantities button and my system cooperates, we can see that there can be a min quantity for every single store separately, right? Uh, which would make sense. So there's also a company value, right, that could be could be summed up together, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, the rules in Retail Pro is you have to be below the threshold. So, you know, let's just get the trick question out of the way, right? So, uh, I'll just write it down so we don't get confused, right? All right, so if our if our min, let's just keep easy numbers here because otherwise I'm going to hurt myself. If our min is 10 and our max is 20 and we have on hand 11 and we are ordering to max, how many do we get? And of course, I immediately said nine when I was getting certified, and the correct answer would be zero, right? We're not below our threshold. We're not below the min. So we don't qualify for a reorder, right? Awkward, but true. Now, there are settings that could change that in the, um, in the uh, auto PO and auto transfer modules. So... Just FYI, the way it works out of the box, though, without changing the settings, is that you have to be below your threshold. So you want to set your min one above where you want the order to be initiated, right? Now, obviously, um, we can manually edit those. So the best way to start out, if you've really never done any kind of min max automatic reorder or anything like that, I'm going to tell you that auto min max, while outstanding and pretty exciting, is mentally challenging sometimes to wrap your head around. Um, it, I've been told it's the hardest section. I was a little confused in the beginning. I get that. Um, anyway, um, so the short answer would be just go in here and, and, and you know click at it and put your mins in. Like if you know what the mins are, then just go put them in, right? I could just say I want I want two of these minimum, which means at at quantity one it's going to reorder, right? I don't even know what those are, but you you get where I'm going, right? So the point is, the best way to start this is to go put quantities into the system and start using auto PO. That's the best way to start this, because then you get a chance to drive the car and feel how it's going to work. So, um, let's go try an auto min max on this. So right now we've set up one store. Let's just do one more. I don't need to do all of them. But let's just do one more 
and of course I don't have my select location button up which is awkward and embarrassing all at the same time and I don't even see it in here there it is select location okay so now we can swap out we can switch from store one to store two right take the same item and put some different quantities on it uh, all right so in real life there would be different min maxes on these right i mean we wouldn't have the same min max on a, a 3xl as we do on a on an extra large that wouldn't make any sense at all but i'm cheating all right so um let's just start there let's just take um all right copy let's go to merch purchasing uh auto po and let's play around with this and see what it does for us right so um all right so first off i could order for a store i may as well go over this as we go through it right i could whip through it and show you but may as well dig in right um I'm going to say company all locations now for what we're about to filter for of course there's only there's only quantities in these two locations right in this one and this one actually so um i could say i want to make a drop ship single store po i want two po's one to go to each store that's what that says right or i could say i want one po that goes to multiple stores that ships to my warehouse And I could choose how the PO gets generated. I could say I like to have a vendor code in front with a date and a sequential number or a time or a store code, right? Depends on what I'm doing. If I was doing separate ones to separate stores, the store code starts to become pretty cool. Um, this has to do with um, what's getting written to the PO. So who is the buyer? This is just what name gets written on there, right? That's all this is and what date gets written on there and what the ship date is and what the cancel date is that's all this is so we'll click next this is considering other things like so if i have a min on this item and the min is two but i have two on order when i get those two in if they're going to go right to fill the orders and i'm still going to be zero on hand right so this takes into account if it's on special order or if it's on transfer order or in transit right um, for now, I'm going to leave these off. I'm just going to see what, just keep it simple here. This is a very important screen. A lot of people skip this screen in, in the, in the auto PO. I don't need the filter. Okay. I'm in my PO in the pool that we call the purchase orders. You should keep your POs clean. So if it's active, it should be active. If it's done, it should be inactive, right? If you don't go in and activate the clutter, you get in trouble. You get a mess. It's hard to receive because you got 50 POs for a vendor that's got two active POs, right? And you got to look through them. So, all right, done with the scolding. Get off the soapbox, right? Now, if that's true, and I only have active POs, it's also true that I could have a preseason PO for next Christmas. So, if I've got to order in on these items for next the fourth quarter of say 2021 i might need some fill-in product before then so if the system sees a po that's active that the order quantity takes me above my threshold then i no longer qualify for a reorder so what's important about this screen is what you allow the system to see for active pos so Okay, if the PO is due yesterday and okay, it's a day late, I'm not going to throw it out and say that's it, it's done. So, do I throw it out at two weeks? Do I throw it out at a month? Let's say a month. Let's say that I consider um, current active POs for up to 60 days in the future. Then I would want to say 
give me 90 days, start 30 days ago, right? I could tighten that up. I could say 45, start 15, right? That's two weeks back, one month forward, right? Whichever. Make it bigger, make it smaller. If you're if you're fast turn, like a pet food store or something, where you're constantly getting two or three orders a week, you're more like seven and four. You know what I mean? Like you barely put in POs and the stuff's there. So this just says what POs are eligible to determine whether the item's already on order. And certainly if it's already on order, we don't want to double the order, right? We don't want to double it up. If it's already on order legitimately in the short term, don't reorder it, right? Okay, what are we ordering to? Are we going to min? Are we ordering to max? We're ordering to somewhere custom between. Now, earlier I mentioned in this little weird trick question thing we did that I could make this be 11. So the order quantity right now is zero, but I could make that be, I could make it be nine if I don't use the min level as the reorder point. So if I'm ordering to max and I'm not using min as the threshold, then the threshold becomes a max. If I'm below max, then I get an order, right? So in that scenario, my little weird scenario that I just typed up, I would get nine and that would be a good thing, right? The bad thing about not using the min is you get onesies, right? The reason you have a min and a max is because you don't want to order one every time you sell one. If you've got 20 is your ideal quantity for max and you're at 19, I don't want to order one until I get down below 12 or something, right? I don't want to be spending payroll on onesies and neither, neither does a vendor. So the reason we, we have a min and a max is to say, you know, what our ideal quantity is and what our what our, our bottom line point where we have to reorder because you know there's lead time and there's order frequency to consider right how often do i order and how long does it take to get there right so we know that we order once a month and it takes a week to get there we need a five week supply that's our bare bones min when we get down to that point we have to reorder so that we'll get product in in time all right, so next, uh, filter. Now, this is the filter that's actually important. This is the item filter. And we're going to pop in here, clear all, and I think I'm going to try pasting that description that I copied earlier. Hopefully, that's the right field. We're going to click OK. And I'm going to say next. And we're going to try finish and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we're going to circle back around and get the right field because we probably got the wrong field if it doesn't work. Right, so it's doing what I ask it to do roughly, right? I set the max at four for one store and six for the other, and you see it's sort of alternating because it's mixing the stores up. It's showing you the same item over and over again, right, for all locations. And we don't really have the ALU in here, but I would kind of like it if we did have the ALU in here, right? Right, so you see the same SKU number being repeated here for different stores. And we could sort it by store if we wanted to, right? Then then you'd see what's being ordered for that store, what's being ordered for the other store, right? And so if we click OK, it's gonna write the PO, right? All right, so we pop back over here to purchasing and take a look at what we just did. Right, so this one here that was written today, um, if we go to form view, we see that it's marked for the zero slot inventory, which is currently SFO, um, and that items in here are allocated. So we're ordering 10, but four are going to one location and six are going to another. Right, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So um, let's get rid of this one. It's inactivated. Bye-bye. Let's go swing back around to purchasing auto PO. Let's pop in here and say we are ordering this for the company, all locations, 
but this time we're going to do drop ship single store. So let's next, everything else can stay the same. Next, everything else can stay the same. Everything's good there, good there. Same filter right now. The, the filter's name here is min max, right? Um, that just means that in the, the filter manager, somebody at some point named it min max. By the way, that was me. But I could change that name if I wanted to, right? And, and if you're going to do auto purchasing on a regular basis and you were doing like this was a Nike order, hypothetically, you would want to come in here, copy the filter, give it a name of your choosing, right? And then be able to just select it, right? Like back here. So if you had all your filters set up, you wouldn't have to be typing them in every time, right? All right, we're going to click next and finish and see what we get. Now we should get roughly the same thing, right? The items, since the PO, I, I inactivated the PO, the PO longer no, no longer qualifies. If I left it there, we would get nothing because they would already be on order, right? But but I didn't. I, I inactivated. It's gone. So uh, we got the same stuff. Let's click. Um, let's click OK and say yes and see what it does. Purchasing, purchase orders. And we got two this time, right? And you can see that. They both have the, the, the vendor code and the date, right, 0204, but they have different sequential numbers at the end. Thus, the need to have that sequential number in your naming convention, right? So, um, form view. All right, so this one's a drop ship directly to store two, right? And this one's a drop ship directly to store one, which is actually has a code of ORD, right? All right, so that's basically auto PO, and that's auto PO with um, with um, <clears throat> with a manual min max is what I'm trying to say. Of course, I'm thinking about all the transfer aspects and talking and thinking. Obviously, is a challenge for me, but but um, let's inactivate this and go back to this one. Inactivate it. And let's go back to list view and show an active. And let's grab this one here, which is the Mark IV multi store, right? And let's activate it. Let's get rid of hide those. So we're back on the first one, right? This one is the one that's allocated, right? This one has pieces for other stores. Now, if we had this, right, um, we got a couple of choices, okay? For a new product that has no track record, and we have a question and I missed it. Let me just see what that is. Uh, is it possible to export the PO in a form that would be uh, forwardable to the distributor? Email. Yes, that's an excellent question. Probably should address that. It's not really an auto utilities thing, but it is an excellent question. So yes, the answer is absolutely yes. With any any document in Retail Pro, purchase order being only one, so receiving voucher receipt for a customer, whatever, right? Um, we have a doc designer. We can design the way it prints out. So if we click print and we have uh, our doc design of choice. Now I'm going to say um, single. I, I'm not, I don't want to show all the allocation here. Uh, so I'm just going to say single. And please tell me I'm going to get a doc design menu sometime soon. Nice. Um, okay, so these are not outstandingly good doc designs. I have much better ones, but I don't think that's the point. We're not doing a webinar on the doc designer right now. So if we if we select that, <coughs> and we then bring that to the previewer, the trick here to email something, it's got to be soft copy. So you want to take it and print it to the previewer. Now the previewer is the piece in Retail Pro that, that receives reports. So when we run a report, it goes to the previewer and we choose whether we're going to print it or not, right? So we can choose to send a purchase order to the previewer. 
And of course, you know that in reports, if you send something to the previewer and you want to see it in Excel, you export it to Excel. If you want to see it in PDF, you export it to PDF, right? So that's the trick right there is get it to the previewer. Then on the top here, just send it out to PDF. And of course, once you're in PDF, PDF's done a very good job of allowing you to link it up to your email. So you can either link PDF to your email and just say, share the file, right, basically, and, and email it right to the, the vendor. Uh, the only downside to that that I see is the file name up here in the top left corner. The file name currently is 64777 which is slightly awkward. Not that awkward. I mean, um, so, you know, if you wanted to um, share this with the vendor, you could absolutely just go in and say share file, right? And it's going to then want to connect up to your, your email, but we're not going to do that. I'm not going to mess with that. Um, the other option is to go to file save as, right? And then at that point, you'd have an opportunity to rename this with the correct PO number and then attach it. You know, that being said, the people at the other end are adults. They can open the PDF, even if it's got a funny name. So, yes, most of that, though, has to do with workstation preference settings, how you how you configure it to print uh, with POs. My my gut and we'll just take a quick peek at that since we had such a good question. Let's get the heck out of here. And do you want to save this? No. Um, and we'll circle back and we'll talk about transfers or the option of transfers here. Um, so options, workstation preferences. The trick here is that in printing, uh, to save myself steps on like a purchase order, is just to knee jerk it to a preview. Like don't even have a choice, right? So pick your printer of choice, activate it, pick your design, allow them to change designs if appropriate, but don't check these boxes. We don't want any of these boxes checked. This is the menu that lets you pick which design, that one maybe and then check this preview up here. That'll send it right to the previewer. And from the preview, you can print it or export it, right? So when you click print with the settings that you see here, it would just go to the screen, boom, done. And then you just export it and email it or print it and send it, or I don't know what you do, right? All right, that's about as far as we can go down that rabbit hole, but excellent question, thank you very much. Um, Okay, so back to the purchase order. Now, this PO, we've got two choices. We could receive it right into the warehouse. And once received into the warehouse, we could use the, the existing auto transfer and just let the auto transfer utility pick up the quantities, right? Um, now, if this is a new product and I type these quantities in, and it isn't, we generated this, so there are min-max levels on this product. But if it's a brand new product, the other option would be that, that from here, we could generate a transfer order right from here, right? Now, this only works if you have a marked for PO that has the item allocations, which we already looked at, built in, right? So just for our information here, real quick, distributed, undistributed, marked for. Okay, the definition of each of those three. Now, distributed and undistributed are very old. They've been in Retail Pro for years. They were here in version six. I think they were in version five. And I'm old. I've been around for all those two. So distributed puts these quantities, this 10 pieces here, on the transfer order, but does not allocate it to the stores, okay? Undistributed puts the items on the transfer order, but does not put any quantities or any allocations. Marked for puts the quantities and the allocations on the transfer order. So for my money, marked for is the only option. Like, I don't wanna do all the allocation here and then go and have to do it again on the transfer order. That's just not productive, right? So. We click Mark for it says 299 was generated. We click OK. At this moment in time, we have two pending documents. We have this purchase order that's pending, waiting for this receiving, and we have transfers, transfer order, 
number 299 out here, form view that has the allocations, right? Built into it. Here's the 10 over here, and here's how it's being split up, right? Now, of course, when the stuff arrives, if it hits and it's now on hand in the warehouse, then you would just go and generate the slip, right? And you could filter it, but why? I mean, the stuff just arrived. It's it's in a big pile right there on the on the, on the receiving bay, right? So you would just go and click next and let it generate the slips, right? So um, cancel. All right, let's inactivate this. And let's go back here now. And uh, we should we should take a quick pause on the voucher just to make sure we um, and of course I just inactivated that. But all right, so all I wanted to do now is I wanted to start the receiving process because if you generated a transfer order i wanted you to understand that it's going to put that note in here right it's going to say in the comment field on the voucher that there is a pending transfer order right so we receive something we find the po we receive the correct quantities we get them on hand and during the receiving when we actually are logging it we're we're then notified that there's a pending transfer order and we are then able to go and generate those transfer slips and basically that's what retail pro calls cross dock and it's, it's going in and out at the same time right it's coming into the warehouse but then as soon as we put the voucher in we know that it has to go out we then finish the voucher generate the slips and we walk back down to the dock and say look here's how you break the load down this much is going to that store and this much is going to that store right we don't need to actually do that to actually have it work however if we go to um auto transfer now auto transfer is very similar very similar to auto po right so um i could generate um held transfer slips i could generate a new transfer order i could generate done transfers Generally speaking, I'm probably in favor of one of these two. I don't want it to make decisions for me that I have to then actually go in and void the transaction and correct, right? If I, if, I, if I do this, I could print this. If I do this, I could print these, right? And then if I change my mind while I'm picking the product, I can modify them when I actually make the transfers, right? So let's... Um, Let's go with the, um, you know what, I probably should have received that. Huh? I don't think I even have, um, I don't think I have enough quantity on hand to, um, let's just go ahead and finish that receiving. Because it will, it will bite me in the, um, PO items. Receive due, okay, and um, update only. Yeah, fine, don't care. Yes, great, good, good, good plan. Let's try that auto PO now, or that auto TO. Let's get the terminology correct here, right? All right, so I'm gonna do held slips, I guess, this first time around. Um, whose name do you want on them, right? What dates do you want on them? What notes do you want on them next? Uh, what's the source, right? Well, that would be the place we just received to, right? Uh, do we want to filter? I don't really care to filter. Uh, available to distribute. If this is a real warehouse, then I'm not keeping any back, right? If it's a store, you know, if the big store receives and transfers to the little stores, then we would we would chop that down to 80 or 50 or whatever, right? But this is a warehouse scenario, so we're going to say leave it at 100. Do we want to consider any pending transfer orders or not? Yes, maybe. Do we want to consider sales orders? Again, with min-max levels, 
if there's also product allocated to a sales order, then that raises the need, the threshold, right? If I have two on special order and two on min, then I need four total, right? I'm going to leave it alone for now. Let's click next. Uh, check all the stores. Click next. Um, what am I filling to? Max, let's say. Next. Uh, do I consider it in transit? Okay, where, where, did I, where did I miss the filter here? Is that, is that, this is the filter here. Was this the item filter? Yep. So here's our, here's our filter that I created earlier, right? It's got my items in it. So I guess I was a little premature in getting through that. Let's pop back over here and finish. Sure. Save the changes. Really always a good idea to save your changes because so easy to make one little switch setting wrong here and not get what you're looking for right so we just received 10 and we said that six are going here and four are going there and it's doing exactly what we told it to do right so i'm going to click ok and we're going to go see what happens right process complete all right so transfers slip i said put these on hold so let's go to the held menu and we have two pending. Okay, let's go to form view. There's this one here and there's this one there, right? One's got fours, one's got sixes, just like I typed in back in inventory in the very beginning, right? So now from here, I could print this, right? I'm not gonna print this. This is literally the worst design Retail Pro probably ever made. It's embarrassing, but I could print that. I could take that out so I could print this one and boom, I could print the other one, right? We could, we could go pick them. And if we come back and we have made changes to the plan, right? We're going to keep some in the warehouse or we're going to send a few extra of one. I could then click edit, bring this one back to active. And I can now change these before I update it, right? I can make that one be eight if I want to. And this one here be before maybe they, misshift us or I don't know, maybe we got to corrected the receiving, whatever, right? All right, so um, then we can hit update and we're good, right? Life is good there. Um, okay, so cancel that. I don't think we really need to worry about that. And then, and by the way, if you do have things on hold, they will be out there forever until you edit them and cancel them, right? Or update them. Ideally, update them. All right, so <clears throat> how are we doing here with our, our little list of hit parade items, right? Um, so auto PO is good. Auto min, auto transfers is pretty good. Um, I will tell you that, that there is another thing that's not even on the list here we should peek at too, um, and that's best replenishment. So we'll have to take a peek at that here in a minute. Maybe maybe now is actually a good time to. I'd like to dive into Auto Min Max here in a minute, uh, but I don't want to hurt people with Auto Min Max. So um, so let's see if we can get some more stuff under our belt before we feel like diving into that that whole mess. Um, okay, so we looked at Auto PO. Auto PO is really pretty straightforward, honestly. Putting in Manual Min Maxes for a small section that you really know well um, is the best way to start with auto PO and auto TO. Um, uh, and typically like when I set up auto TO for the first time, I was in an airport in Texas and we wanted to try something simple. What we tried was the candy bars because every kiosk, every store needed to have Snickers or they're missing sales, right? And there was what, two dozen candy bars? So we just went in and put the min max level in for all stores. Boom, 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 boom. And then we started just doing auto transfer twice a day out of the warehouse. And very quickly we found that we had either overestimated or underestimated the min levels at various locations, right? So that's the, the best way to get a feel for how this thing works. Because when you do an auto min max and it calculates the min for you, it's doing it on straight math, and straight math is great. It's good. We all like math. Well, I like math, but but math isn't real life. Real life is unpredictable, and 
and the, your needs change. Business isn't even perfectly every day. It spikes. It has peaks and valleys, right? So, so straight math is great, but sometimes we have to embellish it a little bit, uh, exaggerate it a little bit. We have to bump the numbers up a little bit to make it actually meet our needs, if that makes sense. So don't don't get stuck on the math. Don't get when you get to min max, say I need a 30 day supply. If you need to type a 45 day supply in there to get the numbers you need, type a 45 in there, right? Just get the numbers you need because you know your business better than the computer knows your business. You're the human being, right? Okay, so let's take a quick peek at, at auto, um, at uh, best replenishment. So. Now, auto PO orders, auto transfer, transfers, and it transfers best from a distribution type environment. I should probably talk about more of that in a minute, but let's just stay on, on track here. Notice that best replenishment is, in fact, in both menus, right? I have no idea if this is even going to work. So we will try it and see what happens, right? Mm, let's see here. I want to pick a date that does not work. So this PO, this this range again sees POs that are active, right? So if I pick the first of January 2001, there should be no POs that qualify. It should reorder everything, you follow? So I'm gonna click next. I'm gonna say max and next held transfer slips. So you see it's mixing the settings, right? It's both auto PO and auto TO, right? We're going to say next, and uh, yeah, I don't care what the, you know, all right, marked for, multi-store, boom, vendor code, date, put the sequential number at the end, next. Um, yeah, me. Uh, today, tomorrow, 30 days, right? Uh, filter, I'm going to leave the filter alone for now because I want to actually see what happens if we run this wide open. Please tell me it, it's not going to take an hour. Hmm. Generally speaking, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but version 9 is much faster at a lot of these calculations because it uses the delta. And the delta has a lot of these numbers already in it. So now what we're looking for, if we can find it, that's what we're looking for right there. All right, so what I was looking for is the point where it changes. And that is right there. So you see the use purchase order column is checked off. So when you're using a purchase order, you're purchasing the stuff, there is no source store, right? And I actually prefer these to be reversed. I read left to right. If I'm looking at the, the bottom section here where we're not using a PL, I want to know it's coming from the warehouse to store one. You follow? So best replenishment will generate both purchase orders and transfer orders, right? or transfer slips. Now, what this does that other aspects of Retail Pro doesn't do, this does stock balancing, right? Based on min-max levels. It's also suggesting transferring some stuff back from the field to the warehouse, in this case, right? This will, this will, this will initiate transfers in both directions based on min-max levels and overages in the field. Does that make sense? So um, now obviously you would not want to run it wide open. You would want to run it for a small section that you could get through and digest, right? You would not want to look at a thousand rows of transfers, nor would you want to try and either create that many and or follow up on them. 
but this is this is what a batch replenishment does. It will build both at the same time. Now, if I did not want these POs, and I asked for a switch for this, but they they told me no, I could I could turn these off, right? If I did not want to deal with the PO part. Now, um, and I skip over things because I do this all day long, every day. Just in case anybody doesn't know this, obviously I could use the mouse to uncheck these, but that's a little slow. The eye hand coordination thing is awkward. You can also use the up arrow on the keyboard and the space bar. So the space bar both checks and unchecks a given box, right? Without the mouse involved. So now, if I really had to do these unchecking, I could at least do it in a fairly quick way, unless I can't get my pattern down, right? Still, that's more than I want to probably go through since I'm probably not going to finish this and hit next anyway. So if we hit next, it would take us to the preview screen like before, and then if we click finish, it would write the damn orders, just like, like it did on the last two go-rounds, right? And then I'd have to go deal with the purchase orders and send them to the vendors, and the transfers, I would have to get to the, to the field. Now, in this case here, if you're a, actually a corporate office and you are... Um, Sending these to the store, you'd be wiser to do a transfer order than, than a held slip. Held slips don't pull, transfer orders do, right? So if you're generating these for the field and you want the field to execute them, then you got to do transfer order. Everybody's good with that, right? All right, so let's real quick talk about the issue of distribution center versus big store, right? Okay. Now, best replenishment handles this quite well. Best replenishment does stock balancing, right? But auto transfer, auto TO, right, is not quite as good. <clears throat> it really likes to have a distribution center. Now, here's why. Okay. Um, and I, I'm very visual, so I draw pictures, okay? Deal with it. Be nice. Don't laugh. All right, so if I have a big store, and let's say I have, you know, three other small stores. Let's say I order 100 pieces in, right? And let's say I allocate, you know, say 50 to this store, and I want 20 in this store, and 10 in this store, and another 20 in that store, right? There's my 100, right? But let's say that the vendor blows it and they only ship 50. They short ship me. So I receive the 50 into the warehouse. And then I run auto transfer, right? It's going to send all 50 out. It's going to leave nothing in the store unless I hold back some manually, right? That's the issue, right? Um, auto transfer, and I've had arguments about this, by the way, with the developer, but they do make a good point when they say you can't transfer to yourself for obvious reasons, right? So it does not respect or see the allocation to the warehouse in the, or in this case, the big store, right? That's the problem. So if you're just doing normal receiving and the vendor is doing a good job of delivering what you ask for, then you don't really have any issues. It'll work splendidly. Now, I had a client in the Midwest who had this problem and they had it on a regular basis and their solution was to get another inventory. So what they did is that they, they just, they don't, they actually didn't have a warehouse. They had a big store and they had three little ones. And uh, what they got is they got another inventory, which acted as a virtual warehouse so they would receive everything into here and they would then auto transfer it out to all the locations so every day the, the virtual warehouse would get populated and every day it would get zeroed right there'd be nothing in the warehouse because it's not fit real at all it's just a, an allocation place right so in this scenario here if we had a virtual warehouse 
and the vendor did not ship us our 100, right? We only got 50. It would take that 50 and send 25, right? 25, half of them would go to the big store. And then it would send probably 10 and 5 and 10 to the other stores respectively, right? It would send what it could at the same ratio to the other stores, right? Because it would then respect the allocation to the big store. All right, everybody good on that? I mean, that's a weird one. Sorry to hurt your brain. It's partly my job though. So, but it's an important, very important concept um, with auto transfer. All right, so let's get rid of this. All right, are we all good to dive into auto min max? Okay, so I don't see any objections. I don't see any other questions. So let's go talk about min max and auto min max. All right, so auto min max now is in inventory. If you're using our screen designs, it's in the utilities menu down here. We, we, there's just some people have shorter monitors and there's so many buttons and we had to like put a bunch of them together, right? So, um, if we go to utilities auto min max, this always hurts people's brain, but it's really not that hard. All you do is you run a sales range, you set up a formula that says how you want it to evaluate it, and then you, you do a calculation and you review the results. That's it. It's it's sales and it's you know it's it's not really that hard. So Let's just go through it slow and see if we can kind of get our head wrapped around it. So I'm gonna to go to change min max value options here. It's gonna ask me for a sales range, right? So this is a sandbox. I have virtually no data. So, you know, let's say we do 45 months, start 45 months ago. And I could filter this, but I'm not. And I'm going to go ahead and say, say all locations. Now, in previous versions of Retail Pro, when we clicked Analyze Sales, and I'm going to click Analyze Sales, it would take, um, if you were on a local machine and you looked at anywhere near the data I'm looking at here, it would take 45 minutes probably to calculate the um, sales for all that many stores, for that many, that big a time period, it would be literally brutal. And if you were on a network and you were actually pulling it from the server, it would be two hours probably to do this kind of calculation. So this typically is not that long because it uses the Delta. So this is actually usually pretty quick. And of course I was tap dancing, hoping it would be done by now. Now, clues that are important on the screen um, on the bottom center of the screen it says delta last updated on and it right now says november 17th 2020 so it would not see sales after november right 17th because it's using the delta to calculate them and i think you would agree that It took like longer than I wanted. What is that? Two minutes, maybe three. But it just looked at 45 months for like a dozen stores, right? And it wrote the sales number for every location and the date range. And you can see the date range in the background, right? You can see back here uh, the 5 1 2017 to 131 2021, right? Written for every item for every store. So even though it felt like it was a little slow, I'm gonna tell you that is, that is amazingly fast to do that calculation in. So, so uh, the takeaway here is, first off, make sure your Delta's up to date, right? If your Delta's not up to date, you're not gonna, gonna get crap data, right? So your date, the Delta has to be up to date. Your Delta should be running in a scheduler, automatic. You should not have to run it manually, right? Okay, so um, let's just click finish for the moment and save our changes. And let's just see, do we have anything at all? Anything, 
it's got a quantity. If now we're going to have to go make something with a quantity, we're going to have to go sell something, right? You really, you don't want to look at this 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 tool in quote theory unquote, right? You want to look at it as uh, in real life as having having numbers that you can make sense of. Okay, so yeah, that's not flying. Let's just circle around and um, go make a sale, right? Choose edit items. All right, we're, we're going to pick on the same style. You know, consistency is good, right? So we'll just keep picking on the same style. So we'll just uh, we'll sell some of these. Okay, that might be a little excessive. I don't mind the 45, but that, that's a little overboard, right? All right, let's just do a um, tender and cash thing here. Let's just get this out oh, because we're not, this isn't a webinar on point of sale, right? Update only. Yes, great, wonderful. Interesting. So let's change this to another location. Let's change a few of these quantities, right? Cancel, delete, tender, cash. Yeah, surprisingly, when you put you know seven thousand dollars in the drawer, the ca the maximum cash amount has been exceeded. Who would have guessed? That's a setting, by the way, in pr in preferences, right? That's fine. Great. Back that out of there. Change this to another yet another store. We'll just pick on two. That's enough, right? We got three stores. I think that's plenty of data for now, right? Okay, so cash. Okay, and update. All right, so if we reevaluate our dates, we should have some data in in a current period, right? So inventory. Uh, utilities, auto min max, change our options. Let's change our, our sales analysis to be, um, let's go 30 days, start 29 days ago. We have to include today, right? It has to be, um, but we're in months. No wonder it's wrong. That's weird. We want to be in days. Probably. Um, all right, so that's basically a month, right? That's not a bad range. So I'm going to fire that off. So this should change the dates in the background. So the, the 5 1 2017. Should now change to 1 6 2021 to, to obviously 2 4 2021, right? And the sold quantity column for that that style that I hacked up, right, should now show uh, information in the sold quantity. So we can filter for that in a second and we can check the other stores and see what the other stores say, right?
Okay, so let's click finish and yes, let's save our settings. Let's drop that filter that in here. And why is our sold quantity not updated here? Hmm. I'm not sure why we're not um why we're not producing a quantity on those. Anything I missed here? There's no filter. All items are eligible, right? Hmm. This is a sandbox, so there could be a setting in the database, and I could go look and see if there's a setting in the database, but I don't want to get us too far off track. So I'm, I'm really kind of on the edge whether we really want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, right, our receipts wrote, I'm sure they're there, that we just did those. And they're on three different stores. Inventory. Auto utilities, auto in max. Dates are good, no filter. We definitely picked our stores. Uh, let's go ahead and drop that in there. It was kind of cool though to see how fast it calculated when we filtered to one style. Yeah, I'm not sure why we're not, and I'm sure I could fix this, but I am sure I also do not, we don't want to waste the time right now. So I'm going to move forward and, and, and deal with it, I guess. But um, of course, I'm itching to go fix that. But all right, I don't want to waste you guys' time on that on a webinar. Um, normally, we would have sales numbers in there. And that's important, and we'll talk about why that's important in a second. All right, so let's go to the next step. The next step would be to build a formula. Now, a formula is a calculation. Let's click New. We can give this a name. Like, I could call this whatever I want. I could call it the name of that, that style, right? And if I wanted to, I could actually go in here, and I could go to Manager, and I could copy this, and I could actually make a filter with whatever name I want to make it, right? So the point being that, that this formula could be as broad or as narrow as you want it to be, right? I could have a basic formula for a department. I could have one for a vendor. I could have a subsequent uh, formula for just one style within that vendor and it, it would be important how I run those right if I'm going to have a generic one and a, and a specific one you'd want to run the specific one after so to speak um, all right so within a given um, formula I can choose down here I got two tabs by the way I got a min and I got a max tab, right? And I gotta decide whether I'm doing a lesser of or a greater of. So if this item doesn't sell in a given size, and I don't mind if the min goes to zero, then I'm gonna say leave it on lesser of. So um, 
if I say, give me, let's say I need, let's say I can get this in a week and I, and I evaluate it every two weeks. And the worst case scenario would be I evaluate it on a given Monday. On Tuesday, the day after, we fall below min. So we did not qualify when I evaluated it, but we now qualify the day after. So I need to go two weeks till I reevaluate, and then I need a week to get there. My minimum would be three weeks supply, right? Now we all know that life isn't perfect. It doesn't always work that way. So if I actually had a three week or 21 day supply, I would probably ask for a 30 day supply, right? I'd probably go for a 28 day supply and round it off to 30. That way I got a week padding in there. That's where I'd start by the way. And if I had to go higher than that, I would depending on the numbers that it generates, right? So um, that right there would work. That would give me 30 day supply on things that are selling if they had a sold quantity and it would give me zero on things that are not selling, right? Now in this particular case, we are in fact filtering for a style. This this formula is down at a very low low level, right? Now let's say that this style is like my mainstay, man. This is the this is the t-shirt, man. I sell these all the time. People come here to get that t-shirt. It's like going to you know a rock and roll hall of fame and not being able to get the damn t-shirt, right? Or something like that, right? In that case, I would want to go the other way. I'd want to go greater of. Now. What, with, what you can do with greater of is you can say, give me a 30 day supply. So if I sell, let's say I sold, I'm gonna keep the math simple here. Let's say I sold 90 in three months. Well, the 30 day supply is 30 then, right? Right, if you got 30 per month and you sold 90 in three months, you got 30 per month, then your 30 day supply is roughly 30, right? Definitely keeping the math simple on that one, right? So then I could say, well, if if a given size is not selling well, so I'm not selling the extra small T-shirt well. It sells, but it doesn't sell that well, right? So, um, but I want to keep my my fixture filled in with the minimum supply of the extra smalls, right? Then what's the lowest number I could allow for that? So let's say it's four, right? So then. If if in the extra smalls I sold I sold one in 90 days I sold one. Uh, when, when it looks at that it's going to say well a 30 day supply is one third of one, right? Which is going to round to zero. So which is greater is zero or four? Well four, right? So you see by using greater of, you limit how far down it can go, right? You're pushing it up. So you're going to pick the specified quantity or you're going to pick the 30 day supply, right? That's what's gonna happen. So if we go to max here and we do the same thing, greater of, and for max, I would probably go like double that, right? And uh, and then go, well, if it's, a, if it's a crappy item, I don't know that I really wanna give it more, right? It can just stay at the bottom number. If it's really not selling, that's enough, four is enough, right? Um, now you also can make different tiered levels, but I, I just haven't had a good reason to do that in recent days, um, actually in recent years. So I could have said from zero to five, we're going to do one equation and from six to 25, we're going to do a different one. And from 26 to infinity, we're going to do yet a third equation. But with that, the dynamic setting of days of supply, I, I don't know that I really have ever found a good reason to do that. I mean, days of supply is going to be different for different items depending on how they sell. So it's going to rise and it's going to fall as needed. And I just realized that um, there's other questions that I did not see. So the questions here that I do need to consider is SRO update. Do you not have to update the SRO date ranges to get that field to update? No. And thank you for that, by the way. But the SRO is completely separate. So um, Patrick raises a good good point. But SRO is not sold quantity so just to let me just save that real fast and pop over here so uh company sold and store sold str sold quantity are not the sold quantity from the min max calculation they're totally separate and if an, an sro 
excellent feature, by the way. Excellent. Good observation, Patrick. Um, SRO analysis is a totally separate feature that populates these fields here, the, the company sold, the company received, and the company on order, right? And the store set as well, right? And I have a great many people who like to screen design those numbers into here. So if I run the last 30 days, this column would represent the last 30 days, but the store sold might represent a year. So I could see both numbers at the same time on the screen and I could play around with my formulas because I could see the results of two sales periods in the background, right? So it's a nice trick to go ahead and bring SRO into this process uh, mentally, um, but it's not really totally needed. Um, and they're totally separate features. And SRO is a great feature. Everybody should use SRO. Everybody should schedule SRO, have it run every night for the last year, for the last 90 days, whatever, and then switch it around and, and re recalculate it as needed. It calculates blazingly fast. I mean, it'll calculate in a minute or so. They do the whole inventory for multiple stores. And then you can have those on all your screens, like on your purchase order screens while you're selecting inventory. You can have what you sold recently, right? That's sweet. But SRO is not directly related to the min-max calculation. So there is something going on there and I could go fix it, but I just would drag you guys through the mud on that. And um, you know, by the time I figured it out, you guys would all be asleep. So not sure I'm gonna go there, right? So we have a sales range that didn't work, fair enough. And if that ever happens to you in real life, call, call text or get Ken on the phone, get Nick on the phone, get Todd on the phone, get one of the techs that, that's done this before and can just answer the question, right? Um, all right, so because I don't have sales information, this is going to default to, since I chose greater of, right? It's gonna put fours in everything, right? That's what it's gonna do. So uh, I'm gonna click next. And then here, if I had multiple formulas, if I uncheck them, they don't run, right? So I could run these in any sequence I want. I could run this one, boom, and then I could uncheck it and I could run other ones, right? So um, I'm going to leave that one checked. I'm going to say calculate levels. It's going to go calculate the levels. I'm going to click finish, and I'm going to see what it did. It did exactly what we said it would do, right? It put four in both columns, right? And by the way, that's 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 as an FYI, if you wanted to take a department and just say, look, I want to put twos on everything here and fours on everything there. If you leave one of those things blank, so if in here, let's go pop back into that formula thing real quick. Um, we used the days of supply, we used the quantity, we did not use percent of increase. If you leave something blank or at zero, then it will be ignored. So if I left days of supply at zero, then the only valid value would be the quantity. And that would just write to every item. So if you wanted to write a number to a large group of items, wouldn't be hard to do. Just write a formula that does it and say, go do it. That's it, right? It'll go right there for you. Um, don't don't play around with the an, uh, annual sales button. That'll annualize your numbers, right? So <clears throat> that'll change the, this number here. So we, we analyzed a 30-day um, a period. If this was checked, Instead of four, instead of so let's say let's say let's 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 put it into perspective. Let's say that in in 30 days I sold 10. So in the background there would be a 10 in the sold column, right? And I check this bottom box off. Then when it goes to look at this formula, it's putting 120 into the formula. I analyzed 30 days. There's 12 30-day periods in a year. I said use annual numbers, right? Um, I, I have not found that to be friendly. And if you use multiple tiers, if you have a tiered thing here, it's going to totally blow you up, by the way. Um, I found it makes it very hard for us human beings. You can make it work either way. The, 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 it'll work fine with that on or off. You just got to know what you're doing. <clears throat> that would be the problem, wouldn't it? That we human beings don't always know what we're doing. 
So I don't generally like to use that, and I find it confuses the heck out of people. I do like this. That just takes the out-of-stock periods that are in the delta, and it disregards them. If it wasn't available to sell, then that would that would change the rate of sale, right? Like if you get it in and you sell it in a week, and you're out-of-stock for three weeks, and you get it in and you sell it for a week, it was only available to sell for two weeks. So that changes the rate of sale if you're looking at 60 days versus 14 days, right? Now, there is one other thing that messes with people uh, that causes the rate of sale to be screw, screwy. Um, <clears throat> and let's touch on that real briefly. Um, and of course, no good examples here, of course. But if we had two items, like in the list, they were basically the same or similar, they both had similar sales, like they both sold 30 in 90 days or something, right? But one of them suggested like a 15 and the other one suggested like a 45 with the same exact sales. Why would that happen? Well, it would happen if one of the items had just been received three days ago and the first receive date was on, on say the 1st of, of February, you follow? The first receive date would would cause this to be calculating a rate, of, a rate of sale on three days instead of 30. So if you sold the same quantity, but you only had three days to do it, you're selling them a lot faster, right? Now that happens on new products that if you've got a new product coming out and people are waiting for it, when it gets there, you sell the heck out of it for the first few days, but you can't maintain that rate of sale, right? So if you're ever analyzing it and you see something spike like that, look look at the first receive date, right? I put it in my screen because it can really mess with your head if you can't see that. Then if you see that, oh, it's the first receive date, we just got this last week. Well, then you could just walk over and say, look, you know, if this thing's here showing a, a 45 instead of a normal number, you just go change it, right? Just go type in what you think it should be. Because you know, we're the human beings. We do actually know something about our store and about our products and about how they sell. <clears throat> and certainly we know if it's a new product, we can't main the, maintain that rate of sale for indefinitely. It's going to trail down, right? So so with that being said, um, when we have it right numbers, um, it puts them in the new min and the new max column where we're then allowed to compare them to our existing min and our existing max, right? We can actually do a little side-by-side -side comparison here, right? So when you see a new min or a new max, if you have no way of evaluating that, if you don't have a base that's solid, if you haven't been using auto PO on a small group of min max levels that you know are dialed in because you have bumped this one up and chopped that one down where it's appropriate and you've been using auto PO now for a few months and it's been successfully working and keeping you in stock, right? If you don't have that that base to compare this again, how do you know if the formula is working? Right? So I strongly recommend that that you you definitely Start with manual min max. Start in a in a section. Pick an item that has you know a few dozen products in it. Set them appropriately for the different stores. Start running on OPO. Just start there. Simple. When you see that an item is either selling uh, out, bump the min up, right? Bump the threshold up. Bump the max up. If you see that you're overstocked, bump, chop it down, right? Get a feel for how the auto PO and the reorder and or auto TO pieces work. And then go, once you got that hammered out, then go run an auto min max on that exact item and play with the formula, right? Again, if you really need a 21 or a 30 day supply, but when you generate a, a 30 day supply, the numbers you get aren't quite right then hack that up, right? Change that to 45, change it to 50, change it to 12. Play around with it. Be a little creative. 
see what it generates for numbers. And when, when you have a solid data set that you know is dialed in, and you can then rerun that formula a few times to get it to, to start acting the way you want it to start acting, now you know how it works in your environment and what kind of numbers really work for you, for you and you can start building a formula on other groups of data, right? Also, I got to tell you guys, um, do not try and do the whole inventory. Do not do it. Everybody who tries that fails and they never get it rolled out. They never get it deployed. Take a small bite, man. Take a small section, focus on one thing, get it done, get it in auto PO and or auto transfer, right? Then take another small bite. Just go in there and build the filters and the formulas specific to things one at a time. Let it take its course. It may take you a season to get fully implemented, but the data will be much better, higher quality, more accurate, and you'll you'll benefit much more greatly from it. Um, now, that being said, you also may want to consider um, in your filter, you may want to consider having some kind of mark. So it could be one of two ways. Um, I, I have a one client who has a lot of parts. What they what they sell has a lot of parts, like thousands and thousands of parts. And so for them, what they do is in the Oxfield field, they just go in and say which ones they'll they'll allow in here, right? So they they take their their um one of their ox fields, one of their user defined fields, which these all seem to be filled up with stuff. All right, so if I take ox six here, right, I could I could call all right. This has already got junk in it. Nice. You got anything that's clean? Oh, UDF two. That's it's a waste. All right, ox seven. So I could say min max, right? I could say this is this is this is a min max item, right? So I could go in and positively say per item that I'm going to let this one in to this reorder process. Now that's a lot of work if I'm doing this for thousands of items, but if I'm cherry picking, I'm only doing it for a few hundred core items. That's actually the way to go, right? Now the other option is to to swing that around the other way and say this is uh, this is um, discontinued, right? Yeah, you only get so many characters in there, you can't get the whole thing in there. So then then down here you could have different different levels, right? You could say it's discontinued or you could say it's uh it's um it's being clearanced. You could you could put in here whatever you want, right? So then in your um in your filter on the other side you'd want to include that in all of your in all of your formula calculations, right? So so in here, in min max, change, next, um, filter, right? Now we'd want to make sure that that was in here, right? And that we were select all on this one, exclude, right? So that probably makes the most sense that you're reordering items on a regular basis. That at some point you say, I'm done reordering this item and you just mark it, it's discontinued. It immediately falls out of the, the automatic reorder process and distribution process, right? So e either way though, it's really a good idea to have a way of managing this. Now, some people have taken this further, like, like you could have a, a min max mark that says is this is a this is a, an A item, this is a B item, this is a C item, and you could then have different tiers where I only I'm only going to do auto reorder on the A items right now. Business isn't as hot going as crazy as I'd like, and I can't afford to do all three levels right now, right? I.e., it's your plan, right? So create a plan that makes sense, that runs your business correctly, and, and go as deep or as shallow as you you have to to make the plan work. But remember that the more complex you make it, the more work it's going to be to maintain, right? You know, marking items that's, that's discontinued is, is, is easy. You, you set a min-max level, boom, they're, they're being reordered. You go and mark it as discontinued, they're not being reordered anymore, right?
that's super low maintenance. You set the min-max levels up, maybe recalculate them once or twice, you mark them as discontinued, don't worry about the min-max levels anymore. They, they're not getting reordered anyway, right? So I like simple, but you know it depends on what your needs are and how you're working it. Okay, so, um, right. Let's close this, okay this. Let's um, back up. Now, at some point, uh, let's cancel, yes, filtered view, okay. At some point, we're going to want to move these from here over to here, right? So once you've run the calculation and you like what you see, you've massaged a few and you want to see those numbers actually be in use, you go to auto min max, you say um, update, right? Uh, all items for all stores, right? We could filter this. There's really no, no reason not to filter it. I have a filter. I've got a small data set I'm playing with, right? And um, update min max. And the background, you see that the four is hopped over from the new min max column to the min max column, right? I don't know if you saw that, but I did. I was watching for it. Um, so it moves it from here over to here and overwrote the twos that were in there before, right? So it's that easy to accept the min max levels, and then you can start using them. Now you can also um, clear the min maxes of any of them. By the way, you could clear the sales analysis. You could clear the, the, the new min max values or the existing min max values. If you want to start fresh, you can choose how and where and filter that. That's pretty easy. Um, you can copy min max. So if I wanted to take and copy the, the min max values using this filter here, right? <coughs> to store three, right? I could just copy those over. And it would copy those over to store three for me. So, you know, if you have a new store, has no sales history, you can't run auto and max on it. You got no, no days of supply, you got no sales. But you got a store that's very similar in demographics and, and, and volume or close enough, you could just copy them and max over to that new store, right? And give it something out of the gate. Nice. I was looking for uh, where is that? Uh, all right, that's what I missed that right a minute ago. So in the update process, right when we're updating all, if you do quantities only, it'll only do things that have a min max, right? They have a new min max, right? It won't do things that didn't get calculated. Which means if it's got a min max now, but it's a crappy seller, and in the new calculation is zero. It won't go to zero unless you do all items, right? That's what that means. So that we're all clear, right? Um, but if I'm updating all with my filter, and if I want a company, right? I want a company um, min max. I could say combine all the min max and write a company value. I just missed that the first time around, and I wanted to come back and make sure we we understood that we could go ahead and generate that company value if we wanted to. You know, the advantage to having a company value would be, okay, then of course it just wiped out, nice. <laughs> so um, I updated it, right? It went from new min to store, and then I updated it again. Of course, the new min was now holding a zero, so I just wiped them out, right? Nice, huh? We could go recalculate them and get them back. I'm, I'm not sure it's worth our time though to do that. Um, so have we accomplished our task here? I think we have. Um, the basic concept is that we have a, a re replenishment point, right? And that we use either auto PO or auto TO or best replenishment to generate various kinds of orders that then gen lead to transactions, either receiving or transfer transactions, right? Um, 
setting the min max up we went through the auto min max there's a lot of settings in there and yes it can be a little painful on the brain that's why we will start with manual min max and auto po right that's the super easy way to get your feet wet right an auto transfer you know you can generate a, a transfer order from a po if it's allocated correctly but the auto transfer is beautiful if you've got min max levels on the stores and you do a multi-store auto po to the warehouse you can just run the auto to then as soon as the stuff hits you can just run auto to and let it generate the transfers right and the beauty there is it it wouldn't be limited to one po right with with auto generating a transfer order it's limited to the items on that purchase order but if i receive five po's and they all had min max levels on all five groups of items and then the on hand in the warehouse is now changed for five different vendors i could just go run auto to and it would just generate big transfers for all the stuff together right so that's kind of a beautiful thing right there um and then of course we we dug into the whole auto preferences we should probably go look at transfer preferences real quick um that's the one thing we did not look at let's peek at that real fast if you have not been playing with transfers and or you're new to transfers let's go look at options system preferences there's a, some settings that do make a difference in here um right so at the top here the first setting is relatively important if you're going to be dealing with transfer orders so this is phrased poorly so it's method for generating transfer slips from a transfer order right that's what we're talking about and the options is on hand assigned and optimized it seems like on hand would be the one to go with but on hand i'm going to put these into a sentence so we all understand them and the sentence is if i did not receive enough product to meet the transfer order's needs if there's a not there's not enough product product on hand shall we say to meet the transfer requirements send nothing that's what on hand means if i don't have enough on hand nothing is going to any store period on that item right so if i need 25 to go to that store and 10 to go to this store and five to go to that store but i only got 12 nobody's getting any right assigned says if you don't have enough on hand to meet the transfer order go ahead and transfer it anyway man i'll fix it later so for most people that's a bad thing there are people that use that quite effectively so i i know of a warehouse back east it's an enormous warehouse they receive enormous amounts of product and it takes them a while to get the receiving transaction done right so the stuff shows up they start receiving it they check it all in and they're 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 keying in the transfer the, the receiving transaction while they're already going out to generate transfers right so for them as soon as they know the products there they want to start generating the transfer order into slips so they know it's there they know that the guy is still in the process of finishing the receiving but they want to generate the slips anyway so just do it assigned right boom done optimize that's the one we're probably going to use for most of us people out there in the world optimize says if there's not enough on hand to meet the transfer requirement deal them out as as close as you can to the original ratio right so if we were supposed to get 50 and we didn't get 50 we only got 25 we'll break that 25 up in the same ratio give the big store it's a allocation shall we say and the little store is their allocations right so that's the choice i would use i would use optimize i would generate the transfer slips and then when the rest of the product comes in i would go back to the transfer order and regenerate more transfer slips because the rest of the on hand is now there right now uh the next uh setting down we don't need to uh, choose transfer order type we don't we're not doing a multi-subsidiary one probably single subsidiary for most of us um after uh, updating a transfer go to former slips probably fine unless you're in a warehouse and you're going to be what you want to start a new slip every time you're probably better off here um, this is just what appears in the left hand column on the transfer order right now it defaults to upc so i'm just going to pop over to a transfer order do we even have a transfer order i think we got rid of the only one we had right so we'll reallocate we'll reactivate this one right so to this left box over here that has the alu so if you don't have if you don't have 
UPCs on everything, you want to switch this to ALU in version 9 so that when I click on this item here and it highlights 623, it then highlights 623 down here, right? You see what it does? It just mirrors whatever you click on on the top is mirrored on the bottom, and I want to be able to visually see that 625 is 625, right? I mean, You guys aren't asleep, I'm helping. Anyway, so uh, what else here is important? Uh, require a comment, probably not. Require a slip to reference TO, probably not. Uh, limit slips against TO to only items that are on the transfer order, no, I would say no. Uh, if I'm transferring stuff off a transfer order and I wanna add something on the fly, I'm, I'm just gonna do it, right? Um, uh, Intra-company transfer vouchers update receive date. This is actually a critical one. This is one added into Retail Pro after long after nine came out and when they realized. So to make a long story short, in previous versions, in slips didn't do anything at all. They, they had no teeth, right? The out slip, the transfer did everything. In version nine, they they <laughs> realized that that was kind of a deficiency and they changed it. And they made in slips into a form of receiving voucher, right? That's what they did. So, um, so, and thanks for the update, Patrick. Or actually, that's uh, that's chance. All right. Um, so, receive our in slips now are receiving vouchers. They're ASN vouchers in version nine. So, of course, what they didn't realize is that in in, in making them a voucher, they would also update the last receive date. Right, so then they had to go and put a slip switch in to to uh, control whether or not that happened. Now, real quick, intra company versus inter company, right? Um, so most of us have a one subsidiary that has one or more stores, right? So a subsidiary. And SBS is the abbreviation. You'll see it over and over. SBS, and this is a store right down here, right? These are stores. Um, that's most of us right there. I have clients that have, have this, and I have actually more than this, but I have people that have a second or third or fourth subsidiary, in which case they also have stores. You follow? Okay, we get the idea. So, in intra is from here to here, right? If I'm transferring from store four to store two, right? That's intra. Inter is between one subsidiary and another. If I'm transferring from store one, so this is sub one, store one, so that would be zero, zero, one zero zero one typically a right if i'm transferring from that to zero zero two subsidiary to zero zero three store three station a right if i'm transferring from here essentially to there right that's an inter company transfer right between companies versus within the company right that's what that is so for most of us, um, this one doesn't matter. If we only have one subsidiary, we can't do an intercompany transfer, right? So this is the important switch, probably wants to be unchecked, by the way. If you have multiple stores and that's not unchecked, it's tainting your last receive date. Well, maybe not. I mean, if you want to know the last time that store got it, right? The last time it was transferred, then leave that checked. If you want to know the last time it was received from the real vendor, then uncheck that and you'll have last received dates be from the vendor only. All right, so um, this isn't really a conversation about transfer configs beyond that. Uh, Auto verify versus ASN though has to do with whether you're using in slips or not, right? An ASN is an advanced shipping notice or an in slip that can be processed after a transfer is received. Auto verify says, look, when I send it, just check it off as been received. Auto verify it, man. I'm not going to do the ASN. When I transfer it, I want it to be done. 
and again, intra and inter, right? So setting this one to auto verify uh, would be enough, unless I had two subsidiaries, in which case I'd have to turn this on and set this one to auto verify if I, if I don't want to make the inslip. All right, so um, that's pretty much it on those. The rest of these things have to do with transfer verification and stuff. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we understood this one. When you're auto-generating from a transfer order, that one there is super critical that it be set correctly, right? So I um, think that pretty much knocks down our requirements. We we went over dropship and marked for, right, in POs. Dropship is directly to the store, and a multi store dropship PO means you're sending, you're telling the vendor ship this to that store and ship this over here to that store separately, right? And just to bring that point home, if we still have our PO, which we do, if I choose to print this all items multi-store PO, right? And we only have stuff to two stores, that's fine. So we'll say continue. And you see, it's 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 saying, you know, this stuff goes to this store here. This is a crappy design, by the way. This design is terrible. My designs are better, but okay, I didn't load those. And this is in the doc, uh, webinar on doc design. So, so it shows you the items and shows you the store at the bottom. There really should be the name and address, and it should be all in there nice. And sometimes I want to put that on top and etc. If we go to the next page, you'll see it finishes the items and shows the other store number down here, right? So if you send a PO to the vendor saying ship this here and ship that there, right? That's those are separate drop ships, right? Those are directly to the and yes, the word drop ship in real life has another meaning. It means to the customer. In this version in Retail Pro, it's always been this way in Retail Pro. Retail Pro refers to drop ship to the store, where marked for means that some of the product on this PO is marked for other stores, right? It's an allocated PO with a central single receiving point. So if you do your own distribution, right, then you want you want to receive it to your warehouse and you want it to be um, pre-allocated to the stores it's going to, especially if it's new goods and they don't have min-max levels, and then, then the receiving guy can just auto-generate the slips from the transfer order and they know the allocation because the buyer usually knows the best way to allocate new product when they're buying, they know what they're buying for, right? So probably best to go with their intuition on that. So if, of course, if you're if you're have a multi-store allocated PO and you just want to send it to the vendor and say, look, ship it to my warehouse, then you just say, look, all single, right? And it just fires it off as one lump sum. All the items going to the warehouse, call it a day. Then you handle the distribution once it's in the warehouse, right? All right, so um, you know it's a fast and furious webinar. Um, I don't know if we went in deep enough. I think hopefully we did go deep enough. Um, but if you have questions, obviously Jeff K at BigHairyDog.com. Um, this this webinar is being recorded. We will. Uh, be sending out a link to it so you can watch it again and again, get some popcorn. Um, are there any questions or is there anything else I could answer for you? Well, all right, then I'm going to say thank you very much for joining today and listening and, and doing a little ride along with me here. Um, and thanks for everybody for showing up, taking some time out of your day. I know you guys are very busy out there. I recognize a few of you guys in the list there that I know you're super busy. So um, I appreciate you taking the time out and, um, and joining us. You know what I mean? All right, then. Um, uh, is there a quick way? We have a question. Is there a quick way to shrink... Uh, the category font size. Yeah, okay, screen design. Uh, you mean the, the screen design like right here, I'm guessing? Um, well, screen design is not really a, 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 an auto utility thing, but yes, if you right click the column header in any list, right? So by list, I mean either the list here inside the document or I mean the list here that is the screen. 
uh, just the category font size. Uh, sometimes they let us ask alternate questions. Yeah, was, no, no problem with that. Um, no, I, I, if I got a minute and we can answer a question, I totally agree with you on that one. By the way, um, so um, so um, yes, I mean uh, by by category. What do you mean by category? Do you mean you mean the the the, the headers here or the, the the fields within? By the way, both are separate. So in your interface, page manager, you've got this one, that's the tabs. So if you have tabs like PO details, if I say show tabs, and I go to this one and make this font something, uh, not font of sans serif, it's a personal problem, bold, 16, okay, apply. So you see I got 16 pitch font on the bottom, right? If I wanna go to interface page manager, and uh, so this here is the grid font. This here is the title font. The title font is what you're talking about. Uh, but be careful with that. Like, so if I go in like this and I say I want a regular 16 pitch, um, it's going to do what I ask it to do, right? Right click again, go to interface, page manager. Grid font is the, is the, the items within, right? So if I say I want Arial uh, regular 12, then I'll get 12 pitch in the in the in the grid, right? So yeah, you can change all the fonts pretty much. There's a few exceptions to that. There are a few places where you cannot uh, edit them, and they're they're only in weird places like um, on a receipt form view. In the tender box, the tender box itself is one of those. And it's the easiest one to pick on, right? Um, so this thing here is one element. I can make it taller, but I can't edit the contents of that box. I can edit the buttons by just going to preferences and turning them on and off, right? So I can I can have you know foreign currency not show up, for instance, or payments not show up, right? Uh, but um, I can't change how big the font is inside the box. So like if, I, if I'm if i on this and I say change the font size, let's try it, right? So we're going to say we want this to be, you know, we want to be able to read it, man. We want to be able to see it. Let's just go 16 pitch, right? And already I see, and you can see it here too, on the top here, the word tenders is now cut off. The word tenders was changed to 16 pitch and is now being subducted underneath the the actual element itself, right? So that did not do anything good for me. Right, so if you want the word tenders to show, you wanna probably not, not do that, right? Gotcha. Now, if you just, so you just wanted the column width to be smaller. Gotcha, so there's actually a better way to do that. So um, in uh, Retail Pro, let's pick on one that's, that's a real common. Um, okay, so the problem you're facing with the column headers is that you can make them bigger, but you can't make them smaller. Like, and really, store on hand quantity. Does it need to be store on hand quantity? Can it just be quantity? I mean, can't we assume that unless it says company, right? And all the company ones say company, right? They say CMP or company, right? So if it's um, a company, it says company. So if it just says quantity, can it just be sort of assumed that it's store, right? So um, well, I mean, if you change the label, that's what I'm talking about. So. If, if you translate that, right? So there is a thing called the translator, right? So if I go into, um, come on, can we open up our little box? There we go, we got two of them now, nice. If we go into our local drive here, where is it here? Probably D drive, yeah, Retail Pro 9. There is a thing in here called translate.exe. So you could, you could build a shortcut to it. I mean, you go there once a year probably, so I don't even know if I would bother. But the translator will let you change labels. Now, if you change labels, 
and you want that to appear at the other store, you have to export those labels and import them at the other store, and you also have to turn them on by workstation. So I just wanted the translator for the first time. So currently, I am viewing whatever the default is, errors. I don't, I don't want to edit errors. I would only edit labels, maybe strings, but probably labels. So I'm going to view labels. Now, um, it's, this has never been set up. This is a webinar machine, and we, I don't do that much on here. So I'm going to go to Tools. I'm going to go to Settings. This is the setup. It's not really hard. You just have to tell it where the, where the translation database is. And surprisingly, it's in the Translate folder. Yeah, I never would have guessed that. And it's called R Pro 9. So you have to say, look, that's the MLD file I'm editing. It's the R Pro 9 in the Translate folder. I want full access. And as smart as I am, those buttons make no sense up there if I don't have little captions on them, right? That's it. Full turn on captions, point it towards rpro9.mld in the translate folder and click OK. And then uh, you might want to screen design this in that um, usually it has all these in there. It's not having any of them in this particular case, but I would want it to have English. I want to have the column that I'm editing in there, right? That's it. Now, uh, if you and we'll we'll go we'll go we'll fix the one first then we'll talk about the issue you raised that it does affect other areas that is true but i think we are totally able to to manage that right now i can scroll down or i could just type in like str here right and i could find store on hand quantity right so i could just change this to quantity now right and i would change this one to quantity now let's talk about one i would be a little more careful with let's cancel our find let's put our our focus in the native column, otherwise your find doesn't work, by the way. Let's say phone, and let's search for phone. Okay, we find a lot of phones. Let's just pick on phone one here. Now, before I dive into phone one, just point, I'm just gonna point out that some of these are lowercase, and some of these are like bold. Like some of these are not bold, and some are bold, right? What does that mean? Well, bold means it is not just one occurrence of that field. So a single lower non-bold means it only exists in one place, just edit it right here, call it a day. If I click on here on phone one, let's say my goal is to edit the customer's phone one to say sell, right? I need to open the details. So that's the first one here. And again, I've got too many languages, so I'm gonna get rid of I'm going to get rid of all of the languages except the one I'm editing because I'm a human being and I'm likely to make a mistake if I don't. Right, so this one here belongs to the vendor. Now I'm going to down arrow and you see that that one's a local customer. So I could change that one to sell, right? I down arrow again, that's also a customer one. I'm going to change that one to sell. I'm going to down arrow again. You see what's happening on the left here. As I down arrow, it, it opens a little menu right there. So that one is the employee. I don't want to change the employee one. So I down arrow again, that's still employee, that's customer address, phone number, right? So I'm gonna change that one to sell, right? You see how this works, right? That one's also a customer one, that one's an employee one. That's a DM customer merge one, fix it or don't fix it, I don't care, that's a t technician's toolkit thing. <laughs> now, what's gonna happen when I click okay is phone one here is gonna break in half. And I'm gonna have two phone ones in here, aren't I? the ones that have been changed and the ones that haven't, right? So so then, same thing here, by the way, if you're gonna do phone one, the developer was less than consistent in their implementation of fields column headers. So you would have to then go find all versions of them and you would have to fix these too, right? Um, anyway, I'm not gonna bother. The other weird thing about this is, uh, let's just pick on this field here since we can. Notice that the save button here is, is, is available. I could click it, but when I press enter, it then grays out. The thing auto saves as you go. I literally never get to click save. And it always drives me nuts when I go to close and I think, oh my God, I haven't saved, right? But anyway, back here on the main menu, if you then make a translation, you then have to go to options, language, you have to turn on said language, right? So if I translated the English column, I have to turn on the English column. 
And if I change the translation, I have to turn it off and turn it on again or exit Retail Pro and reload it. I've got to reload the translations, either by reloading the software or unloading and reloading in the language menu, right? Anyway, that's probably a smarter move if you're looking to narrow the columns because there's a limited amount of screen space, right? Uh, and you want to make things fit better, uh, then I would just go change the damn column headers like that, right? That's better. Quantity, boom, done. I don't need to say str space oh space. Oh, what, what, what? We're, we're, it's we're not the on hand. What is it? It's something else, right? Everything else that has another meaning, like like store sold actually says it's store sold or it's company sold. So the one that just says quantity could just be the on hand quantity and I could not have to live with an enormous field. But anyway, that would be my two cents on making things smaller if you see where I'm going. Excellent question, by the way. And we had the time, so certainly no big deal to, um, to feel the question like that. Any other questions? Before we all turn into pumpkins. <laughs> uh, well, all right then. Um, again, I'm gonna say thank you for joining us. It's always nice when you guys come and join us. And um, this will be emailed out. And and um, and version 10, by the way, the nice comment. But the version 10 is out. It's it's actually technically called Prism, and it's a totally different animal. Uh, for those people that haven't seen that, can we do we even have it up? Let's see what do we have up here. Yeah, that's not what I want to see. That's our music, by the way. I probably should just click that little button while I'm at it, right? Get the rest of the tech happy. Um, <clears throat> that's version 10, just so we're all on the same page, prism, right? So it's totally different, completely different animal. <laughs> it's a good question. Should we have music in the background for this? No, we probably could. I don't know, but uh, it's hard. It's a little distracting when we're doing something like this. So we don't usually do anything like that. Although you probably can hear it in the background. We're doing oldies today, so probably heard it in my microphone. But um, we like to keep it mixed up a little bit. You know, we don't do uh, heavy metal every day, shall we say? In fact, we we never do heavy metal. But anyway, um, no offense to those people who love heavy metal. Um, with that, though, uh, again, thanks for joining us. If there's no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and depart and tell you guys to have a great uh, day, a great weekend. Stay safe, please, out there. Stay safe. Hopefully, we'll all be past this thing soon. All right, then. I will talk to you guys later. All right. Bye-bye.